Hi, I'm Seed Senate, I'm from the RE. Um, uh, come to give hopefully a short talk on a, a number of research projects we've been working on recently. Um, apologies for those who have seen some of these slides before. I'm sure I, a lot of you would have. We're going to focus on two key areas that, that in reality, the, the wider uh, retrofit industry are just completely ignoring uh, thermal bridging and air tightness issues. So we'll start with the thermal bridging um, section. What exactly is do we mean by thermal bridging? Well, if you do a U-value calculation, you take account of water ties, if it's a timber frame, you take account of timber stud work in the U-value calculation. That is a form of thermal bridging. But the, th the, the type of thermal bridging that is ignored is what happens at the junctions between elements, between the floor and the wall, and around windows, for instance. Um, and th those heat losses are not included in new value calculations and therefore are not taken into account when you're doing uh, eco or green deal, for instance. And as I say, it's, gen it's generally ignored in most refurbishment projects. Right. So just to confirm, and I've just been told not to touch the screen, um, <laughs> a new value of the floor is the area of the floor times, uh, right, the heat loss of the floor is the U value times the area of the floor. And similarly, the wall is the U value of the wall times the area because the heat loss, but there is still heat loss through the physical junction as well. That's over <coughs> and above those two. And if you can also look at the way that the actual heat flow occurs, you can see on this particular uh, one, there is additional heat flow from the wall into the footings below ground level, uh, below floor level. So therefore, that will have quite a high heat loss in terms of thermal bridging. And obviously that's a computer model, and what we need to do is also demonstrate it happens in real, real world. This is a, a multi-storey block of flats in Western Supermare. Um, typical 100mm APS insulation on the outside to get the U value at 0.3, equal funded, but they didn't return any insulation at all in the reveals or under the lintels. So whenever you have a, an actual infrared image such as this, remember the, t the temperature scale is critical because the same color doesn't mean the same thing in each image. So the, the actual center of the image, the wall is at minus 1.2, other parts of the wall are slightly colder. What you can see around the windows, the temperature is in the nine, 10 degrees more. Now that is simply because there is 50, 60 mil of brickwork that was left and that was just rendered over. So there was no insulation placed around these windows at all. Now it is very difficult to do uh, permanent insulation when you've got existing windows, unless you're re replacing everything at the same time, um, which is highly unlikely because you can only afford to do one thing at a time in most situations. So a solution for this particular project could have been using very high performance, very thin insulation in the reveals, both on the outside of the windows and the reveals on the inside of the windows as well. So that you would not have such a lot of heat loss bypassing the window. Because if the, the actual wall outside is at 11 degrees, the wall inside is going to be pretty close to 11 degrees as well. And if you get below, anywhere in a dwelling below 15 on a surface, condensation will occur. Um, right, so we're doing a project right at the moment in Northern Ireland in Antrim, um, refurbishing um, seven no fines houses. No fines concrete, if you don't know, is essentially you, you strike a shirt and you fill it with gravel that's coated with wet cement. There's no sand, nothing. So what happens is when the actual wall sets, you're left with lots of air pockets. So in terms of thermal resistance, it's a lot better than mass flow concrete. It has other issues though, as um, we'll find out later. So on this image, again, remembering the temperature scale, um, you can clearly see there's a number of bright points. And um, we believe those are the original um, heating pipes from this community heating scheme that is no longer in use. And pipe work going up into the roof voids and then travelling right the way through the roof voids of all the terrace and then dropping down individual properties. Um, there seems to be some leakage at 
the ceiling and also at the top. Now, we, this particular property only had 100 mm insulation in the roof space when this um, thermal imaging was taken. So there would be heat loss going through the ceiling into the roof void. But I, I think that this point here is just simply where you've had um, the second story shuttering completed. It's all gone off and then they've cast the gable on top and there just isn't uh, an, an adequate seal between the two and that's allowing even more heat loss just at that point. And that's made even worse at uh, intermediate floor level. You can see you've still got the situation at the rear of the property, but from this point onwards, the floor joints actually change direction. So where this much brighter um, heat loss is, is associated with what they use to actually... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No problem. Anyway, you can see the angle built in, and that's to support the joist ends, but obviously it's also halfway through the wall, so any benefit that the, the air voids had in retaining heat was lost because they were bypassed by a 6mm, 10mm steel plate. So you get that thin strip of extra heat loss at that location. And we're onto this slide now, anyway. Yeah, sure. Right. So again, across the eaves is a very bright spot. Now, what happens at the top of the, the first floor wall lift at the front and back, they have a, a cast reinforced ring beam. And that the, then supports the roof. So you have the situation where you have effectively lightweight pump because its conductivity is in the region of 0.6 and then you've got 2.23 so a significantly higher heat flow just at the eaves location which of course is where you don't want it would say um, which in itself is co for, for causes a challenge for doing uh, refurbishment right. so okay. they clearly see the, the steel angle which hooks into both lifts because that would be the end of the top of the first uh, ground floor lift, then you place the steel in to support the joist before then casting the first floor lift and then sitting the joist on hangers at a later date. And at the ground floor, um, again remember the temperature scale, uh, but you can clearly see that the actual floor perimeter is significantly higher than the rest of the wall. And again, it's just simply Brickwork and um, concrete uh, infill and cavities is higher conductivity than the wall itself, so you get extra heat flow through in that location. And this becomes a very critical location, therefore, for condensation as well. Right, there's the biggest problem that, that we see is that there's no requirement to tackle thermal bridging when you do research, none whatsoever. And in fact, proof document L1B, which covers renovations of thermal elements, which is what a retrofit is, says it's impractical to expect thermal bridging calculations to, to be done in existing buildings. However, thermal bridging heat loss is a major contribution to the performance gap of any material. It's, it's not just how it's installed, it's, it's how it actually interacts when it's actually in situ. So you must know this, you must have heard it plenty of times, that the, the additional heat loss through a thermal bridge is called a psi value. Um, but the problem is, the more insulation you build on your wall to improve the volume value, the more, more you're forcing heat to find a weakness and the weakness is the thermal bridge. So you'll end up having more heat flow, not just as a proportion of the total, but more heat flow physically through the junction. So what you should do is dot measures to reduce how much the, the, thermal, bri the thermal bridge and heat loss will rise, because you cannot stop it. You cannot re get rid of it completely, but you can reduce its effect by detailing properly. Right. So I'm going to um, take you through a particular case study, um, but also I'll include this image here simply because every dotted line is a thermal bridge. 
And if you do an internal wall insulation, there'll be vertical dotted lines in the middle of walls where your intermediate walls stop the continuity of the insulation as well. But um, we were approached by a um, social, uh, social landlord. They had 310 different non-traditional house types. There was four basic types, two of which were a concrete frame, one was a timber frame, one was a steel frame. But the most predominant one is this particular type of dwelling, which is the, the one that started refurbishing first. So we did thermal modelling for them, got them into contact with um, local um, domestic energy assessors who could work together to form a package of measures. Um, we also had to uh, assist in finding a particular type of external wall insulation, which I'll, I'll mention shortly. Um, so we did the preliminary, we explained all the issues, we ex explained what savings could be made so that we could then work out what you go for and you go for. And the next stage was for us to assess the potential issues po post uh, retrofit. They went ahead and did a pilot's property first, just to make sure that they were satisfied before they got go, went down the eco line, the uh, green eco um, route. And as you can see, it's an external wall solution. Um, but in terms of how typical it is, very typical in obviously wherever you've got a drain, don't move the drain, just cut a hole in the insulation. Um, don't even think about moving the meter box. Uh, so, but, and the thing is, you don't take account of the fact that that much insulation has been taken off the wall. You just see all oh, the walls being upgraded to this yield value. Um, so this is the, the, the actual type of uh, concrete frame dwelling it is. You have a rough foundation then a concrete kicker. Um, Precast concrete columns going on the corners and the party walls. Yet yeah, they were supplied with a moulding to cast these infill blocks on site, um, which ended up they had been 50 mil, 75 mil, and 50 mil. So the concrete's only 50 mil thick in certain locations, which meant that you couldn't fix insulation to those walls unless you first set a real system fixed to columns, and then you could support the insulation from that. Well, obviously, the cost of that. And so we had to actually look for uh, a, a system that was, a, 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 was adhesive only, didn't require fixings. And there is at least one out there because we did find it. Um, and this was material that was used in the property. Now, it's a standard great EPS material, but it is the, the actual bonding agent is the critical thing for, for this. Of course, the wall has got to be in a good structural condition first. So a lot of these properties will need to be repaired where there's been some settlement and shrinkage, for instance. But once that repair is done, the system is just adhered to the, um, the surface and then rendered over. Um, part of the, the way that the, the system was done is at, at the joints, if you had to put two sets of these blocks together, there was essentially a, a section that needed to have a cast, sit, cast in situ um, reinforcement so that it actually gave it the wall rigidity. So this is uh, a Triscoll thermal bridging uh, image of the, the wall after it's been insulated. And you can see it's dense concrete up to, um, well, just above about 250 mil above ground level, and then the finished floor levels are roughly about 250 again above that. So the actual, what they did do with the external wall insulation, took it well below the floor, the ground floor, even below the floor joists. And yet, you can see, these lines, if, if a wall is homogenous, these colours should all be parallel. Anything that starts to have an angle such as that, you can see there's a massive amount of heat flow into the footing. Now, you could make it better if you actually put some perimeter insulation down from the underside of the main insulation down to the footing, but then you're digging out concrete footpaths, you then definitely have to move drainage and everything, and it's 
it's not it, it's not practical, really. So the psi value of the junction before the insulation went on was negative, which all that means is that the actual heat flow in that junction was less than what you would work out if you used the U value times the area. But it's only slightly less, 0 0.037. But afterwards, even with the insulation going way below floor level, the psi value 0.3. Now that's roughly what the default value for that floor junction is in SAP. If you, if you didn't, if you built a new house and you didn't follow their credit details and you didn't want to do the model, you would have to use that figure, 0.32, I think it is, in SAP. So it's, it is exceptionally badly performing, simply. Now this is a a slightly different view. On the other side of this, I've actually left out the section of insulation where the meter box is, and you can see the difference in the colour on the on the inside surface, and that relates again to temperature on the on that side. In the normal situation, you, you've got a tiny little bit of yellow, but it's mainly oranges, and, and yeah, oranges. So it's around about the 16, 17 degrees on the inside. So it should be okay in terms of not having condensation. But where the meter box is, the temperatures are well down into the yellows, so you're looking at 12 and 13 degrees. So because you've left just a small amount out for the meter box, the chance of condensation, and it's likely to be in a cupboard anyway, the chance of condensation and mold growth is exceptionally high. Now, you can also see that Although the area of the meter box is only about the, th the middle third of that, the heat's flowing from that distance again from the inside. So although you've only got a cut out 450 mil for the meter box, 500 mil, whatever, it's actually coming for about a meter above and to the sides, the extra heat flow. So no surprising then that the, the psi value is, is overworn. It's three times worse because you've left out a tiny little bit of insulation in that location. And as I mentioned, it's significantly reduced surface temperature to the point where you get when you get condensation. Now again, typical practice when you come to an existing roof, if you're not replacing the roof, why would you take the insulation up to the insulation in the roof level? Just stop it at the, the, the actual socket. It's not a problem, is it? So the existing roof was already insulated, the, uh, the, the, the existing soffits had been replaced recently so they didn't want to do them again, so on this particular property they stopped it at the soffit line. Now you can see there's the concrete ring beam at that location and there's no continuity between the insulation between the two and again yellow is on the top of that wall indicating that you're going to get condensation mold growth. So, because it's concrete ring beam, the existing psi value was fairly high anyway, at 0.19. But afterwards, 0.77. This is the worst psi value I've ever seen. Well, I can fully understand it because, again, you can see on the side, the heat flow is starting well below the ceiling and just flowing up the wall to get out through the easier route. So of all the junctions that were that were modelled um, before side values, some of them quite high, um, they were not too bad. Um, they improved the, the side value afterwards of the lint, remember that they didn't try to um, take any insulation on the uh, underside. But 0.5 is roughly what you, you have for a steel lint on. So it's it's no worse in that terms, but it's what's the important thing is what is the increase in the heat loss, because it's the cumulative effect of the heat increase in the heat loss that is the issue. Now, the corner reduced slightly, as, it, as you would expect, um, as did the jam, because the jam was the one location that they actually were able to put 30 mil return of insulation in, just 30 mil, and that's the effect it had, significantly reducing the thermal bridge, not eliminating it, but reducing it, and therefore reducing the effect of heat loss and also condensation risk at that location. 
So the proposed volume value was 0.28 when you multiply that by the total uh, wall area. Total heat loss was 19.5 watts per kelvin for the walls. You add up all the, th the increase in thermal bridging heat loss, not the thermal bridging heat, heat loss, this is the increase and it's virtually the same as what the wall U value heat loss is. So in effect, because you didn't do anything to try and mitigate thermal bridging heat loss, you doubled the wall U value. It went from 0.28 to 0.56. Well, of course, 0.28 goes in the equal and Green Deal calculation. Already mentioned that there's no regulatory driver to reduce uh, thermal, thermal bridging heat loss, but there's no commercial driver either. Because in Eco and Green Deal, it's assuming the same thermal bridging heat loss both before and after. Now we're just seeing how much it can increase after if you don't to try to do something about it. It's always going to increase even if you do, but it's getting that gap down. Now, solid wall insulation in use factor for Green Deal Eco says that you calculate your running costs before a measure, you calculate running costs after the measure, I upgrade the wall to 0.28, and then whatever the savings are in running costs and carbon, you reduce by a third. How, mu how much of that third is taken up by doubling the wall U volume? Because there's other issues, it's the, the material performance in the real world. All these installations are tested in labs. So once you put them on something that's real, are they actually performing that way? And installation practice, how many fixings are actually used when you're fi fixing insulation? I know there's a su general assumptions that oh, it's five for certain types of slabs and it's four for some others, but I've seen six and eight. Especially at difficult junctions where you're near a corner and you've got to put a small bit in, but you've still got to put four in a small bit and then four and so a bit on the next corner on the side. So the corner has additional fixings. You might have additional problems going around the windows. So insulation practice, gaps in, in between the slabs, gaps behind the slabs, all adds up to why um, when you actually install insulation on solid walls, it doesn't perform as you would expect. Right, well, I'll quickly go through air tightness because it's, it's a lot easier. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. Air tightness, it's infiltration, it's not ventilation. So that's something that you've got to distinguish between the two types of air movement. Ventilation is something that you control. You can open your windows, you can open trickle vents, you turn on extract fans. Air tightness is there every day, whether it's windy or not, there's air leakage in and out of your buildings. And just where does the air leakage occur? Absolutely everywhere. Um, in my own house, there's a howling gale in the kitchen every time it's windy outside. Now, well, I do live in the Lake District, so it's windy a lot. Um, but on the outside of this beautiful stone wall, there isn't a single hole or gap or crack or anything. So that air is coming in somewhere else, but finding its way into the house in the kitchen, and it's from where the pipes are behind the unit, so it, it's not something that's ever going to get repla repaired until the kitchen is replaced. Um, and yes, if you're not using the fire as a fireplace, seal it up, because that's an air leakage path. So, I think you can actually see on, on this resolution, this is a small pencil order of a property um, quite, a, quite a while ago now since it was doing the Sheffield Eco Terrace, and you can see there's a gap in the floorboards and the slopes uh, leaking out quite easily when it's the building's under pressure. That's the first floor, not the ground floor. So it's getting into the floor void and it's getting out of the floor void somewhere else, the air. Probably where it's built into the wall and not pointed in, or the pointing in's shrunk, whatever. So you get on a building when it's even slight when you get a positive pressure on the windward side, slightly negative pressure on the leeward side, and that pressure difference draws air through the property. But it comes in wherever it can on the outside surface, 
Then it finds its way into a room. It goes through into another room and then finds its way out of that room. It's three-dimensional. It's not just, oh, we'll just seal up the wall and we'll just do this. You've got to understand, you've got to have a continuous line for air tightness. Um, another, another interesting thermal image. Um, again, temperature scale. This is one of the properties in Northern Ireland where um, there was air pressure testing being done as well as at the same time as thermography is being done. And you can see that cold air has been drawn in at low level and up behind the dry lining. Now, it's even windy in Northern Ireland, it is in the Lake District, so this will be the natural state of affairs every day. So, are these the tools of the trade? I hope not. I really hope that we're, we're a lot better than this now. So, air leakage causes all of this, which is obviously if you lose heat today, you've got to replace the cold air that's coming and heat that. Um, but if you've got cold drafts, people tend to turn the stat up just a little bit more, say 25 degrees, just because they don't want to feel cold. Even if the air temperature is warm enough, they don't like being in drafts. And the big issue, big technical risk is that air leakage can cause condensation, both in terms of surface, because you can see how that air came in behind the plasterboard and cooled the face of the plasterboard. But if you've got warm, moist air getting forced out at another point, that can condense within the structure. So, air leakage rates, you know that's meters cubed to meter squared per hour. What does, that, what does that really mean? Well, typical air, air permeabilities, air leakages, depend on what the construction is. New build are getting better. I mean, it's because we, we've had, it's had site of us from 2010, but it's down about half of what Golden Reg's maximum is. Simple projects. 17, Sheffield Eagle Terrace, don't worry you're not last. Sheffield Eagle Terrace was 22 as the existing. But in terms of what that means is in every hour and a quarter, the air is replaced within the dwelling. That's pretty staggering that you've got to effectively, in an evening, heat the volume of air three, four times. No wonder how the energy goes high. Just a quick point, if you're doing major refurbishment schemes, it is worthwhile getting air tightness testing done. Not on every single property, but just to get an understanding of how the properties in general um, perform. Because if you don't fix the problems before you do the refurbishment, you still have the problems. They don't go away. Um, it can be cost effective if you do a number of these on the same day, in the same location. Uh, we had to actually, ourselves, we've got one team, but we had to actually get an outside contractor to do some work for us because uh, our own team was busy on a major contract and we d didn't ask for any dis sort of discounts. We just said, well, what is your, your price? And there was three properties and it was just under £900 for all three. In the big scheme of things, isn't a huge amount of money. And the, the recently renewed AMA website lists all installers on a regional basis as well. And I think that should be it. It is. Thank you very, very much.